The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Joining me for what I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating conversation is friend. And um, I, do I call you a science communicator or mental health communicator or mental health professional? Dr. Hector Garcia, how do you what's on your business card? You can call me all that. OK. Stuff. All right. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a dilettante of sorts, I guess. Yeah. I need to put all my cards on the table. Of course, Dr. Garcia is a friend and uh, he asked me to read the audio version of his book, Alpha God. We're going to talk about that, but I want you to know that the reason he's back on the show is not because I'm just shilling for books. You should get the book, but not because I narrated it or because he wrote it, but because it's a conversation that is really interesting that talks about the primate origins of so much of what we see in religions, especially relating to violence and the oppression of other people, often women, have a lot of people seen the book without even really cracking the cover? They just read the jacket and go, oh, shit, you wrote a man-hating book. And you just run with that baton. Have you seen some of that? A, a little bit. And, and, and mostly um, not so much from looking at the book cover, but maybe some podcasts. You know, I have people saying you know, maybe, maybe this is being biased against men or, or religion when, in fact, it's, it's none, of those, none of those things. Um, and I've, I've kind of learned from experience to, to preface any discussion about the evolutionary sciences with a caveat about what is called the naturalistic fallacy. It's worth repeating here, Seth, because uh, you know, the, the fallacy is such that, that just because something may be arrived at through genetic means or through biological means doesn't mean that it's moral, doesn't mean that it's inevitable um, or desired, you know. A lot of times it's none of those things, you know. I mean, so much of what fills our day-to-day lives, the technology, I mean, uh, you know, from driving a car to medicine to to, to wearing eyeglasses are examples of how we don't have to abide by by the hand that our genes have dealt us. We can make different choices. But uh, nevertheless, you know, I I feel – you know, having uncomfortable conversations is crucially important if we want to build a better, more humane, more peaceable, uh, you know, world. Yeah, it was an uncomfortable conversation about religion that led me out of it. I mean, I is that right? Yeah, you know, sometimes I think uncomfortable is a healthy place to be. It's a healthy place to to be. It's a yeah. I mean, we have to allow ourselves to feel some discomfort. Because the the discomfort of having difficult conversations is far worse than the consequence or consequences of not having those conversations. In shades of the progressive culture, and I consider myself a progressive. I'm you know I'm a heathen liberal like so many. Um, <laughs> I like to think I'm issue by issue. I just happen to end up you know in the liberal box in so many of these ways. Right. But there seems to be kind of a backlash against gender studies, looking at the differences between men and women, and then we get into, well, how do you define gender? And and it, it seems it's all getting really messy out there, and it's hard for me to pin it all down. And so let's start with the merits of gender studies. You think it's a, a healthy, these are healthy discussions to have? What's your take? I think our reproductive psychology influences so much of our personal lives, so much of our political psychology, so much of, of our religions that we have to have, we have to have conversations about them because, uh, you know, our, our reproductive psychology is capable of, of very good pro-social behaviors. I mean, or it's, it's, it engenders those kinds of behaviors and it also can engender the worst of humanity, 
So it's important to look at these things. And, and it's interesting how you mentioned, you know, being liberal, because I think liberals and conservatives tend to um, commit the naturalistic fallacy in different ways. So, if, you know, my fellow lefties tend to think more like, well, you know, if we look at any any gender differences, um, that must mean that that gender inequality, we're, we're, we're justifying it, which is not the case, right? And, and people on the right um, might be more inclined to think, generally speaking, that, you know, any gender differences are proof that it's natural and uh, that, that, that maybe gender inequality is natural and desired because we might have, you know, some differences that, that can be construed as, as justifying that, if that makes sense. When I was a Fox News conservative, it was all like we, we just sort of – uh, retreated back to conversations about the plumbing. I mean, you know, look at how people are made or look at how they are born. That's man, that's woman. And that's as far as we took it. We never got into the psychology of sexuality. We never got past this, uh, you know, this sort of, um, I don't know, binary, for lack of a better way of looking at it. Um, I don't know. I, I it, Much of it still confuses me. I want to learn as much as I can about it, but I don't want to be afraid of discussing it because it would be propagating some sort of inequality out there so yeah well i i think people are going to misconstrue no matter how you put things in and other people maybe not i mean you have a conversation about about gender and you're going to get people who say well so and so is making excuses for men's poor behavior and on the other side so and so is bashing men you know, but there there are are interestingly there are evolutionary reasons for taking one tack or another. You know, one thing that I find very striking, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but like the the Jordan Peterson movement. What do you think about this this popularity of this guy? Because I mean, personally, I don't. You know, he has rose to so much fame in such a short amount of time that I find it kind of baffling. Just if you kind of compare it to you know, maybe the contributions that he's made, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem commensurate with what he's done as a scientist or as a writer or anything like that. But it's interesting because a lot of people have paid attention to what he says. And it's all about, a lot of it's about gender. What are your thoughts about that? Well, it's funny. I released a podcast conversation with my buddy, uh, Matt Dillahunty, and he debated Jordan Peterson on stage and, Mm -hmm. and, I take a lot of heat for, for just, I mean, I, I do not get Jordan P. I, like, I don't, I think I'm on your page here. I'm just like, someone explain his popularities. And I think there is, you know, p- people gravitate toward these sort of strong, charismatic figures. There's some potential degree mongering going on there. Uh, lightning may have just struck for his career at a specific time and sort of the national consciousness I can't really explain fully his popularity. I don't think it's based on merit. And the more I hear from him, the more I really feel like there's almost a cult of personality taking place. He is one of those guys who demands a large following. He makes a shit ton of money. He is hugely popular, and his fan base is nearly, they approach him like a religious organization or religious group of congregants might approach their spiritual leader. Yeah. Do, do you see that parallel? I see that. And, and you know, uh, so I, I sometimes don't understand him either, literally. So I think, I think there's a lot of equivocation. Like I remember seeing a, a debate that he had um, on YouTube and I, 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 I was listening to what he sings like I didn't quite get it. It's like maybe I'm just not focused today or I'm just not smart enough to get what he's saying. So I rewound it, rewound it, right? Again, again, like by the fourth time, I'm like, no, he's actually not saying anything. I mean, there's a lot of if you can't dazzle them with brilliance kind of thing. But he does touch on on he does touch on masculinity issues. I mean, he, he said, for example, that um, – you know, I think the way, and I'm totally paraphrasing, but that we should uh, we should enforce, we should legislate monogamy, and you'll see more stability because of that. And a lot of men are like, "Yeah, that's a great idea," 
and and I think he appeals to this, you know, this viewership that kind of rests on this idea of fragile masculinity. Have you have you heard of that term where like, you know, maybe people who maybe men who aren't totally sure of themselves or their place in the world or or in their ability to acquire mates. Um because if if that if you're unsure about yourself in that way and you hear somebody, you know, um, saying these kinds of things, it's going to resonate with you. Oh, we got to get into this fragile masculinity, toxic masculinity. Just saying the words out loud causes a great many people just to go into a tailspin. They just lose their minds and check out and whatnot. Well, let's get into this term. What's it mean? What is masculinity versus toxic masculinity? More with Dr. Hector Garcia in just a second. So I took a physics lesson in about 15 minutes, and uh, I'm totally not kidding. It wasn't a lesson, really. It was a book or a compilation of key points from the book by theoretical physicist Carlo Rovelli. It's called Seven Brief Lessons on Physics. And I was able to read it in about a quarter hour on Blinkist, actually understandable information about Einstein and the theory of relativity and getting into quantum mechanics. I mean, that's an intimidating subject if there ever was one. But on the Blinkist version of the book, downloaded right to my Kindle, read in about 15 minutes, I learned stuff like they call it quantum mechanics because quanta refers to these little packets of finite energy. I didn't know that. I learned about atomic and subatomic particles and how the universe isn't really made up of things as much as it's comprised of events. I learned about thermodynamics. Did you know that heat can actually change how we perceive time? I mean, this is fascinating stuff delivered in a digestible format that fits my busy schedule. Potentially, it allows me to learn from several books in a single day. Blinkist has thousands, I mean, thousands of nonfiction books in a bunch of categories condensed down to their key points. You can enjoy them in both digital print and audio formats, and it's amazing. I mean, I did a recent speech that talked about Dr. Robert Cialdini's book on how marketers use psychology to influence us and get us to buy their stuff. The book's called Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. That book is available as an 18-minute read on Blinkist. And right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for my audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Seth to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash Seth to start your free seven-day trial. Blinkist.com slash Seth. Talking here with Dr. Hector Garcia about tribes, Trump, and the masculine male. I'm interested in terms like like masculinity. Is it's it's something that when you say the word, now there's all this baggage attached to it. I mean, there are different. There's toxic masculinity. There's fragile masculinity, and I think some of these terms are worth discussing. But you know, we can act, we can say you know being masculine. Or feminine, or what? These are not pejoratives. These are not. We're not this is not. A, it's not an insult to say someone is masculine or feminine. No, I don't believe it is. No, not yeah. at all. I'm interested in. Uh, we had mentioned on a, a show we were talking to uh, Dr. Abby Hafer and a few others about the difference between masculinity and toxic masculinity, which is something that took me a second. I heard toxic masculinity. Some people are saying that being masculine is in itself toxic. I just totally, you know, knee jerked for about a microsecond and then realized what they were talking about. And it's this sort of masculinity that is often handed down culturally from the father, the grandfather, you know, I'm going to toughen you up. Uh, I'm too tough to go see a doctor. I'm too much of a man to share my feelings. Men don't cry. Men aren't vulnerable. I knew a guy who he was a man's man, right? The, the cliche man's man. He's a cowboy and he was, uh, he was working with a, a pocket knife and he cut his finger like to the bone and he refused to go to the doctor because 
I'm a man, you know, I'm, I'll just, I'll just put a piece of duct tape on it and super glue the top of it. And no one will ever know, you know, and, and to him, that's what men, a real man doesn't need assistance. And, uh, so I'm interested in your perspective on masculinity versus toxic masculinity. Well, listen, I, I, my big love is the evolutionary sciences, and I think um, they're so good at explaining the ultimate reasons for things that we do, um, for our preferences, for our likes, for our dislikes, for behaviors like you just described. And not expressing emotion or not showing emotion, you know, that's that has utility or had utility in our evolutionary past. So – when you look at who we were as a species, we evolved in, again, close-knit groups of uh, – small groups of, of, of tribes people topping off at about 150 who were very frequently at war with one another. You know, when we were hunter-gatherers, it was, it was a, a very – they were very violent times. So all the research points points to that that fact that you know one one study of hunter gather contemporary foragers and, and hunter gatherers found that up to thirty percent of men in those societies are killed by other men. So one of the ideas behind why men tend to withhold uh, their emotions is because doing so in combat is can, has a, a great deal of value. You know, there's a, there's a thousand ways that I could describe that cutting off your emotion, doing what you're supposed to do, doing what you have to do to survive is necessary in combat, even modern day combat. If you have to shoot somebody at close range, if you have to stop a, a bloody femoral artery bleed and, and, you know, not freak out when you're doing it, you have to do that and not show emotion to the enemy who may use it to exploit you. So, you know, what has utility in those kinds of environments doesn't have the same utility in family life because you have to show emotions to and, and express emotions and feel emotions to, uh, to have healthy relationships. Let's talk about that from the angle of projections. If I'm a gorilla on the African savanna, like I'm the, let's say I'm the alpha primate. Am I afraid to show weakness because weakness would then be an invitation for other males to try to sort of usurp me, to dethrone me, to – I would lose what I have if I showed a crack in the armor, some of that going on? Yeah, enemies will, will use you know, your you know, fear to exploit, to exploit their rivals. I mean, just just look at how uh, UFC fighters face off with one another. They, they, you know, when they when they after the weigh-ins, when they take those photos of them facing each other, showing intense, you know, just coldness and meanness. They don't want to show fear. You know, when you smell fear in your enemy, you can use it to exploit your enemy. That's that's a, a pretty a pretty known fact that evolutionary scientists have kind of capitalized on and said, okay, maybe maybe this male stoicism comes from that that utility. You know, in that environment. But again, you know, so much of of what benefits in one, us in one environment may not benefit us in another environment. You know, and that's that's a concept known as the evolutionary mismatch, an adaptation that no longer serves us. So if you're if you're a, a bird with a special kind of beak for cracking open a certain kind of nut that grows on a certain kind of tree, that's fine, and until that that tree you know, becomes diseased and the whole forest of that species, you know, dies, then it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't serve you anymore. So the evolutionary mismatch idea, you, we can see that today with, with, um, you know, so in our, in our evolutionary past, uh, high sugar, high fat foods were very rare, but very useful to us because, Back in the days of our hunter-gatherer ancestors, resources were scarce, and you didn't know where your next meal was. So to gorge on sugar or fat when it was available, it served us. Does it serve us now? Not necessarily, not when we can produce fat and sugar in these insane amounts, um, and it's so accessible. So now we have you know, um, epidemics of morbid obesity, type 2 diabetes, and all other kinds of health problems that come with that. So – that's an idea – that's that's an example of an evolutionary mismatch that has to do with you know internal medicine. Um, one thing that I often think about 
and that I write about in my upcoming book, Sex, Power, and Partisanship. I think I don't think I had a title last time we talked, but was how political conservatism evolved. When you when you um, when you look at our political orientations, they they fall on the natural curve. So you see, you know, there are people who are very extremely conservative, a lot of people in the middle, and some people uh, on the extreme end of being liberal. So when you look at at that natural curve, you can map on xenophobia and and what's termed as xenophilia right onto that curve. Xenophilia is the interest in other people. Xenophobia is the fear of other people. Conservatives across the world, research finds that conservatives tend to be more fearful of other people. Um Whereas again, you know, liberals tend to be more interested in in world travel, uh, other cultures, listening to world music, learning another language, eating at an ethnic food restaurant. So, let me, if I may, unpackage this because it's kind of a complex topic. I think relevant to what you're saying. Um, another thing that maps onto to xenophobia and political conservatism is fear of germs. Conservatives worldwide tend to be way more f- germ phobic than liberals. There's all kinds of ways to test this. This is a very consistent finding. So the idea, not put forth by me, but by other scholars, is that in our evolutionary past, pathogens were incredibly dangerous. If you get exposed to something that you don't have an immunity for, it can wipe you out in no time. You know, people died from simple afflictions like the cold or diarrhea. You know, um, well, who were the biggest vectors of disease? Outsiders. You know, we, we saw that concern when that Christian missionary landed on that island of, of uh, you know, those, those – it's somewhere off the coast of India and they killed him, right? And the concern was, hey, this guy's going to spread this disease to people who don't have immunity for it. Well, so th- that fear evolved at a time that far predates our understanding of what hand washing does. It far predates, you know, the availability of vaccines or antibiotics. It benefited us in our evolutionary past to be fearful of outsiders, to be germ phobic, right? The question is, does it benefit us now? Now, as we're moving towards a, a globally interconnected world where we're, where we're interfacing in, in terms of cultures, languages, uh, economics, does that tribalistic mentality that you see concentrated in men – does that benefit us? So that's that's one of the questions I think we need to ask. It's kind of a long way at arriving at a point, but I, I think you, you may get my meaning there. Uh, I'm interested in how we choose our leaders slash male celebrities or the people who inspire us who are male. And you had written in your book, Alpha God, about, you know, there's all of these – things that come into play that can be traced back to our primate ancestors or lower primate ancestors. And I look at Donald Trump and I'm like, you know, you've got uh, the outward projection, nonstop outward projection that they are stronger and you are weaker. You have the pursuit of, and often the cloistering of females. You have the acquisition or quest and acquisition for resources uh, stuff, you know, the gold gilded baby carriage and the skyscrapers and the limousines. And, uh, and you you see these very basic traits displayed overtly in often hugely popular and influential men in the 21st century. Can you speak to that? Oh, listen, uh, you know, I, I had written about this with in, in terms of Donald Trump. Jane Goodall has written about this. So, you know, we both kind of smell that distinct chimpanzee aroma coming from his camp. <laughs> um, you know, he, so going, stepping back for a second, there is really compelling evidence to show that, that we tend to prefer larger leaders, taller leaders. You look at the past, I don't know, hundred years of, of, uh, presidential races and the taller the candidate won almost every single time. Um, why is that? Now, we, let me stop you. Is that a correlation causation error there? Or have there been studies about larger men and the success and or failure of men that speak to that? You see, you see, um, 
you know, men higher up in the church hierarchy being taller. You see men who are higher up in, in corporations tend to be bigger men. So the idea is that, look, we're attracted to larger, more formidable males because, you know, it it benefited us in our evolutionary past to ally with more powerful males. You can see this in chimpanzee, you know, chimpanzee troops. You can see it in our preferences for, for, for big men. And no big surprise, you know, Donald Trump is always bragging about himself and demeaning his rivals by calling them small. Um, um, Marco Rubio, little Marco, uh, George Stephanopoulos, little George, you know, he calls people small. He wants to accentuate that, that, that size difference. You know, it's, it's all very, very primitive. So, um, you know, you have a, a, a big, loud male making a lot of noise and there's going to be a certain section of of the 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 electorate who, who that's going to appeal to now another thing about about conservatism is that people on the conservative spectrum tend to be more fearful on a wide number of uh, to a, to a wide number of, st- of different stimuli and there's even research showing that they have a larger amygdala amygdala is is the fear center of the brain so if you are on the more fearful side of of the population you hear this loud, big, boisterous male saying he's going to protect us from the Mexican rapist. He's going to build a wall to, to, to define our territory, to define our borders. That's going to have intuitive appeal to you. That's the thing. And, and so I, I, I do think it does come from a very primitive place. And the appeal of Donald Trump to so many women who adore him despite his flaws, despite the red flags – who adore him, this is an evolved instinct, and instinct's maybe not the word I'm looking for, reaction, uh, an evolved trait. They respond to these sort of signals of strength and dominance? Oh, I, I think so. I mean, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's research showing that, that women prefer larger men more when they're ovulating, when they're more fertile, um, and part of that may be protection. There's uh, research showing that men, pr- women prefer m- uh, men who have who have won uh, uh, medals for bravery in combat. Uh, men who have light facial scars, which suggest a history of fighting. You know, there there is that appeal. Uh, th- there's so much evidence that 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 does speak to exactly what you said. These, these are instincts. These are instincts that get enacted below the radar of consciousness and uh, result in you know. The election of, you know, a pretty objectively, uh, you know, nightmare of a shitty. president is yeah, a awful, shitty yeah, yeah. <laughs> idiot. You know, G- Gavin Newlands, a, a British member of parliament, put it this way. It's like, you know, Trump's an idiot. I've tried to use more parliamentary terms, but yeah. he is, in fact, Just an idiot. Well, you know, this is dicey territory, and I'm, I know that this can easily be quote mined by those who are eager to misconstrue or misrepresent. But right. we'll just talk about it anyway because that's how that's how you know knowledge works. Let's explore these issues. But the admiration of a woman in the direction of Donald Trump is that a flavor of you know this? There's a specific. Let's say there's a woman whose mother always said, "You need a good catch. You need somebody who's." smart and has a good job and can take care of you, who'll buy you the big house and get you the car. I mean, this is a cliche, but the clay, cliche exists kind of for a reason. There's a flavor of this, at least in the culture that I come from here in the Bible Belt, where if a woman is standing there and she's in the market for a companion, a life partner, a, a spouse, and a guy pulls up in a 78 Pinto and the guy behind him pulls up in a Lexus with a silk suit and obviously projecting wealth, power, all that stuff. They're going to go for the guy in the Lexus. And in, is that a little bit of the flavor of kind of what the appeal of Trump is? I'm sure it's more complicated than that. Forgive the clumsy question. but uh. No, I, I, I think you're, you're on to something. I think I – think, and first, let me, let, me just, let me just speak to something you just mentioned. Personally, I'm okay with, with being you know, kind of direct about Trump because I think the whole world – 
knows it. The whole world knows this guy's an abomination of a leader. But but anyway, to get to your question, yeah, I there, think yeah, they, the whole well, <laughs> except for my family at Christmas time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, motivated <laughs> reasoning is strong. You know, forgive will, the interruption. Sorry, forgive that diversion. Go ahead. Please di- divert. Yeah. Um, because because I, I I have those relatives as well, and uh, it's it's really encouraged me to look into like how what kind of excuses have to be made, what kind of acrobatics uh, mentally have to be made to 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 justify a leader like him, especially if you're if you're an evangelical Christian, got eighty percent of the evangelical vote. You know, I, I think his behavior seems to uh, fly in the face of so many Christian values. Like so, with the handshake, you know, he grabs the hand and pulls the guy forward, and he he looms and gives you the stern look. He's got the thousand yard. Well, it's more like a ten yard stare. This is all stuff we would see in a tribe of primates out on the savanna, right? It's so primitive. It's so primitive. Yeah. But I, I think you're right. I think wealth, uh, you know, always has a certain appeal. Um, David Buss in his book, Evolution of Desire, if you want to read a really, a really amazing book on this topic, does studies uh, internationally across every culture, across, well, you know, across every continent, across, across cultures, across languages, across religions, across socioeconomic status, and found that women on average prefer – um, wealth twice as much as men do, uh, in part because of the cost of child rearing. It's it takes it, children, human human offspring are incredibly costly in terms of nurturance and support and care and protection. But there's more than that that I find so fascinating. There's this idea called the sexy son hypothesis, which I write about in both of my books, and, and that's the idea that women will seek traits in in men that result in their male offspring passing on their genes more. In other words, having more uh, reproductively successful male offspring because, uh, you know, a woman can, can reproduce uh, her genes through her sons exponentially at an exponentially higher rate than, than her daughters. So mate copying is, is a behavior seen across the animal world where, Certain females will only mate with, with, with males or will show a preference for males who have already mated because that shows good traits. That shows good traits that could be passed on to sons, right? If, if you want to look for a trait in, 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 a, in, a, in a reproductive partner that's going to result in a lot of male offspring, you want somebody who appeals to, to, to females. You want somebody who appeals to the ladies, the sexy son, right? Because if your son can attract mates, it's going to pass on your genes. So there have been studies looking at, at uh, what women prefer. Women find men more attractive in photographs when they're surrounded by other women. So even though you know Trump, by all standards is 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 just engaged in incredibly undesirable behavior towards towards women i could i could i could you know talk about that for a long time but i think you know what i'm talking about interesting too that uh where there are not experiments done where people were in different types of clothing maybe one was wearing you know the plastic fast food name badge and the other's wearing a suit and tie yeah. and it might be the same person but they're perceived differently and and I don't want to be unfair here obviously the converse can be true i mean we'll see you know a a man who who might be on the hunt for a a well a wealthy female who who might be able to enable his life of luxury sure but it seems to me that um at least in the culture around here in the United States, um, there is a rewarding of men more than women for projecting this type of dominance behavior. Wealth and being surrounded by women, that kind of thing. And of course, you know, in, in, in countries where there's more gender equality and, and women have, you know, as much economic security or, or, you know, approaching the economic security and opportunities that, that men have. You know, you see less of that emphasis, but still it's ancient. 
it's ancient. And that, that may be part of the appeal to this man who has, who has said things like, you know, what you, you know, what I really look for in a woman is an, is a nice piece of ass or something like that. I forget. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He said some, he said some really nasty things. Well, I, s- I sent a screenshot of the text of the grab them by the pussy quote to grab my evangelist father who, who thinks that, you know, Trump is God's anointed man. Right. And he did, it's like, he didn't even see it. He just kind of blinked, you know, and, and uh, he was like, you know, praise the Lord. You know, he's God's me. He just literally, it just blew right past him. It's like he just ignored that piece of data. Oh, you know, the Lord sometimes has to use flawed and imperfect people to carry out his perfect plan. Yeah, he's a sociopath, predatory, lying son of a bitch. But he is God's man in this context. I hear this all the time from the religious here in the Bible Belt. We're going to talk more about tribes. Why do we have a tendency to be so tribalistic now that we are not living like our ancestors on the African savanna? We're going to talk more about this tribalism and religion in just a second. Hang on. One of the biggest complaints that I have had in the kitchen is that I'm lousy at the prep, like pouring through the fridge and the pantry, shopping for all the ingredients, assembling everything. I'm just not that guy. I do not enjoy the process of preparation. I just would rather cook in the kitchen. But I love to cook. I mean, I really do. And HelloFresh has made me a better cook. It's made me a happier cook for sure. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that does all the planning and shopping and prep and then delivers the ingredients with step-by-step and deliciously simple recipes with pre-measured ingredients right to my door. I mean, every week you just cook it, you eat it, you enjoy it. The recipes are on these easy-to-follow six-step recipe cards that actually have pictures (laughs) The meals come in these uh, specially insulated and recyclable boxes. All the meals take max 30 minutes. They require less than two pots and pans. The cleanup is a breeze because everything is already set up and pre-measured and ready to rock and roll. They're lobster ravioli, freaking delicious. They have a wonderful chicken dish called Presto Pesto Panko Chicken. You'll love it. And HelloFresh knows how to make a burger. I am dead serious. We're huge fans of HelloFresh. Choose from the classic box, the veggie box, the family box. You can choose from a selection. Just pick your weekly meals on the HelloFresh website or on the app you can download to your phone. And right now you can take advantage of HelloFresh's special offer for 2019. You can get $80 off your first month by going to HelloFresh.com slash SethAndrews80. Promo code SethAndrews80. Try them today. You're going to love them. 80 bucks off your first month. Go to HelloFresh.com slash SethAndrews80. Promo code SethAndrews80. My patrons get a commercial-free broadcast every week. And they get the show early, a couple of days early to be exact. And if you aren't a patron, please consider becoming one at patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. Talking here with my special guest, clinical psychologist, Dr. Hector Garcia, author of the book Alpha God, The Psychology of Religious Violence and Oppression, and the brand new book titled Sex, Power, and Partisanship, How Evolutionary Science Makes Sense of our political divide. And I'll link to both of those books in the description box if you're interested. Because you get into evolutionary psychology, let's talk about the utility of religion in terms of tribes. I was talking to Dr. Andy Thompson, and he was speaking to the usefulness of religion to perhaps create tribes among non-kin. So with a religion, I don't need a bio family, like an immediate family tree to have my tribe. A religion is another unifier. And uh, I don't know, I'm sure you've delved into these studies. It's a vast ocean. You can sort of take that wherever you want. But can we speak about the evolution of religious ideas in terms of tribes? Oh, my gosh. Religions are nothing if not if not tribes, you know. And I think the religions that that tend to be most successful have certain facets of them that emulate the primordial tribe. I mean, most religions have a headman, right? It's usually a man. <laughs> and like we talked about, people higher on the church hierarchy tend to be bigger. You know, they have people who who get together and 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 uh, and um, 
you know, under the protection of, of, a, of dominant male gods, of dominant male gods who are interested in their sex life, just like a dominant male primate might be. So, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there is a survival utility to, to religions, or there was anyway, especially during the biblical era when it was just an incredibly violent time to live, where people were just hacked to pieces with bronze weapons uh, all the time. Um, you know, at a time where the only thing preventing one group from doing it to another group was their ability to do so. So in, in, in those times, yeah, it, it certainly made sense that for religion as a means of survival because of, because of its ability to get people to cooperate, especially if you have a God who's watching you and making sure you're, you're making the moral choice to not screw over your neighbor, right? It's also a stamp of ownership, right? I mean, if I'm a conquering army and, you know, I'm the Christian army and you've got all your pagan gods, I would go in and I would stomp your guts out or do whatever that a conquering army does. But it's interesting that they ceremoniously sort of destroyed the old gods and replaced them with the new god. It was this um, symbolic kind of spiritual dominance. They didn't just conquer them physically, but they conquered them in terms of the gods they worshipped. No question. I mean, th- you know, I, I grew up in, in, in the Southwest. I, I'm from El Paso. And a lot of people have asked me, like, how did you get interested in writing this book called Alpha God? And I, I you know, I keep coming back to my own heritage because that area where I grew up in, the history of the region is just so rife with religious conquest. And that is something that the, that the Spanish did in mass from – from you know uh, uh, the tip of Tierra del Fuego all the way up to to you know Colorado, you know they, when they conquered when they conquered uh, the native inhabitants living in the Americas, that's one of the first things they did is they toppled their religious shrines and laid a cross in there. This is the new territory. This is the new alpha male. My God is more powerful than your gods, and you must you know placate yourself. You must you must prostrate yourself. Uh, and placate this God, ne- kneel before this God. But it was always with kneel before me because I have this special alliance with this God and, and I know what he wants. So, you know, kneel before me and, you know, give me all your gold and all your women. I'll yeah, I saw this uh, <laughs> film. I, it wasn't a good film, but it was a Scorsese film called Silence about the Jesuit priests who were going to take Christianity to secular Japan. Or, you know, uh, the heathens in Japan. Yeah. And, you know, they were, they themselves were being uh, martyred and tortured and killed and all these horrible things in the name of their God. But they felt it a worthy crusade. And so the Japanese were trying to turn the Christian missionaries encroaching into apostates. And so they would place a, sort of an embossed metal symbol of Jesus on the dirt and they would say, put your foot on this, step on this to show that, uh, you know, you are an apostate. And the whole time I'm screaming. And, of course, there's death and torture and all these other things, these consequences, if they don't put their foot on Jesus. And they were agonized over it. They're like, oh, I don't want to be weak. I don't want to be an apostate. I don't want to betray my God. And I'm screaming at the television, put your freaking foot. I mean, it hurts no one. <laughs> right. It doesn't change what's in your heart. Just put your foot on the Jesus there. Uh, right. I don't know. I, I don't know if you've seen the film or you wanted to speak to those types of symbolic gestures. Sure. I mean, if you really believe that doing so jeopardizes your position in the afterlife, you're not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about the battle against religious organizations, tribes, ideas um, as non-religious people? You know, it's it's hard, Hector, because I, how do we go up against the billions of dollars, the thousands of years religious machine, when so few who are non-religious want to organize? They seem to be nervous that doing so makes us religious in some way. We would then be just another incarnation of the church. And I think, well, you know, if we're all just going to be individuals out there throwing pebbles at the castle walls or rather at the encroaching tanks 
uh, we're never going to get anywhere. Have you experienced this kind of resistance to organization among atheists and secular people? Yes, and 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 you know, I I, I say this with the caveat that I'm I'm pretty new to this this movement. I didn't even know this this free thinking atheist secular humanist community existed before I wrote my first book. Um, but but what I have observed is you know it's. So, so there's the idea of tribalism. You know, tribalists usually have, you know, they kind of deify their their leaders. They have a figurehead. They they usually, uh, you know, don't tend to question authority, right? They tend to really want to follow follow the rules of the hierarchy. What I have noticed is that in so many ways, the, the free thinkers tend to be kind of the anti-tribe, right? If a leader screws up, oh man, or they think they screwed up, he's out, you know. Um, rules are questioned all the time. They're questioned, which I think is, is, is this movement's biggest strength, you know. So, the, so there's kind of like this anti-tribe feel, but I think sometimes I, I, I do agree with you. I think sometimes maybe it goes too far because, um, like like this this Sunday assembly. I, I know you're familiar with that, you know. So 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 groups of atheists and free thinkers that get together on a Sunday to you know talk about science, talk about politics, whatever, listen to music. You know, a lot of atheists who don't like that because they know this this smacks too much like a church. We can't do that, you know. But but religions don't own community right they they don't they don't they don't they have not cornered the market on having a community and i think i think if we if free thinkers want to grow as a as a voting block you have to organize you know i think i think it's important to look at what draws people to religion besides you know all the fantastical ideas talking snakes etc what what draws people to that we need community. We are social animals that need community, that we need a tribe, you know. So, so if I go to Sunday Oasis to hang out with people who are ostensibly of like mind, we have similar things to talk about, perhaps similar uh, framework to sort of look at the world. That is tribalism, but it would be a healthy representation, hopefully a healthy representation of tribalism. Is that what you're saying? Well, listen, you, you probably know more about these organizations than, than I do, but I, I, do think, I do think it's probably healthy to walk a fine line b- between you know, just being totally an individualist and, and do without the, the political power that you might have if you were to organize. And the other extreme is to just blindly follow the group, which I think it, you see more in, in religious circles. That's probably think, the biggest difference. I mean, yeah. you know, there's a herding cats element to free thinkers in groups anyway, right. but it sure is beautiful when we find a common goal and get on the same page and put aside all the pettiness and really try to encourage and support and connect with each other as human beings. I mean, we are the human tribe, first of all, and yeah. I think a subset underneath that isn't necessarily an unhealthy thing. In fact, it might be quite beneficial. We are the human tribe indeed, and, and uh, you know, that's, that's the thing about uh, – that's a very xenophilic thing to say, like <laughs> I was just mentioning. We're not just the insular tribe of, you know, whatever. We're a human tribe. It's a very, you know, xenophilic, liberal way of thinking, which I think is great, you know, and that's, that's what I was talking about earlier. Does it really serve us to block off into small groups and identify an outsider – uh, you know, if nothing more for the sense of euphoria that it it gives us to to become a collective, the sense of security, you know, we can create enemies. We can create the outside tribe where they don't even really exist. I heard somebody talking about – I hadn't heard it phrased this way. Again, coming from that sort of binary black, white, A, B, yes, no, good, evil – uh, yeah. mentality that evangelical conservatism breeds or fosters. I was like, America, God and country, love it or leave it, we're the greatest player. I knew nothing about what I was talking about, but I, we right. just deemed ourselves the greatest. Mm-hmm. And somebody had been speaking about the fact that, you know, these borderlines were subjectively drawn 
by men. Yeah. I mean, who decided that the border would be right there and who decided the border of here would be right there? And what happens if we decide the border should be somewhere else? We have the power to be able to redraw how we see the world, where it's not about these subjectively drawn lines of demarcation, division, separation, but it can be more about unification. I guess I may be, to many shades of a globalist, which would cause Donald Trump great chagrin, I'm sure. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that borders can't be beneficial and are even necessary, but it's there's a liberation in seeing the whole planet as the human condition, right? I, I agree with you. I, I sometimes wonder, you know, how, how much better off would humanity be if we openly shared technology and ideas and, and funded, you know, research projects together? And, and so, I mean, you know, we, we, our biggest adaptation is our ability to interact with one another and to understand one another and to focus our attention on, on, on group tasks um, would we be better off if we could somehow manage that? Yeah, perhaps. Um, do I think that we're there yet? No. Oh, sh- hell no. <laughs> do I think I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that deluded, Dr. Do Christian. I think that there – yeah, I know you're not. Yeah. Do I think that, that, that it's, it's safe to indiscriminately open borders? No, of course not. Neither one of us thinks that. You know, and, and one of the things that I think that I – and am concerned about sometimes is is the mass migration from Islamic nations to Western nations and and what kind of dangers that may pose. Do you ever think about that? Do you, do you think that you I can do. have like a like a calm conversation about that? Because that is a, a, a sticking point for many of my fellow lefties. They they get really worried that any discussion about Islam is racism, whereas yeah. obviously Islam isn't a race. No, we get into that quite a bit, and I happily use uh, the opportunity to say that Islamophobia is not a thing. And ex-Islamists like Faisal Said al-Muttar and Ali Rizvi and Yasmin Muhammad and Sarah Hader and others will, you know, Muhammad Sayed will talk about this. Islamophobia is not a thing. It is in many ways designed as a conversation stopper and a way to protect bad ideas from criticism. Islam is not a race. It is an idea. You can be Middle Eastern. You can be Spanish. You can be straight up Oklahoma white guy and you can be an Islamist or or be uh, part of the Islamic faith. And so I think, you know, people get respect. Ideas have to earn it. And, you know, it's it's intellectually dishonest to ignore Islam. Yeah. Or what it is, which I consider to be at this moment the most dangerous in a strong field, most dangerous religious um, entity on planet Earth. Certainly the most uh, globally volatile. Uh, and so it, it is a weird balancing act where we want to protect the liberty of people to be able to worship as they see fit within the bounds of the law. And at the same time, call out the nonsense, the misogyny, the the violence, the the really bad ideas that exist within Islam. I've noticed too, Dr. Garcia, a kind of a whataboutery. Once you start talking about Islam, they'll say, the Quran, what about the Bible? It's a weird deflection, and I see it often among liberals as well, that it frustrates me. Yeah, and I, I, I think there there certainly are conservatives who can be kind of Islamophobic and just be, just, you know, this idea that we should ban all Muslim immigration and, you know, Muslims should enter into a, a national registry kind of like like the Jews of Nazi Germany, which was proposed by Donald Trump, both both ideas. I think I think that's that's people can certainly be xenophobic towards towards Muslims in general. But on the other hand, people can certainly conflate Islam with with race and and not see that, hey, it, 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 it's a political system. It's a political system. <laughs> From what I – how I describe it, based on male reproductive imperatives. Now, talk about a reflection of the alpha male model. Just yeah. look, at the, look at the Islamic structures, Islamic governments like uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, so the World Economic Forum – it's a research entity – does this massive 144 
uh, survey called the Global Gender Gap Report, where it looks at income, educational level, access to health care across, across 144 studies, uh, countries. And consistently, the, the, worst, the worst nations in terms of gender equality are Islamic nations. Now, you know, gender equality has never been about men trying to gain as many rights as women. It's the other way around. Most of the, the, the things that, that men and women are unequal on in those nations have to do with reproduction. I mean, you know, women aren't allowed to divorce in certain, certain Muslim nations. They're not allowed to travel. And, and all of this stuff gives women a, a route of egress from, 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 you know, male reproductive imperatives. Um, certain countries, women aren't allowed to work. That allows them to, to, to feed themselves and, and not just be baby mills, right? So all of these things have, have implications for our reproductive psychology. Um, what's also interesting is that the most politically conservative societies also tend to be Muslim nations. There's ways to measure this. So, um, so political conservatism is really, as I argue in my upcoming book, is really based on, on you know, male reproductive drives and imperatives. The sexual control, the mate guarding, you know, which we talked about before, you know, the, the anything you can do to avoid cuckoldry, you know, co- swathing women in burqas so that they won't be tempting to other men. I would encourage everybody, and, and again, I, I know I read the audio book. I, I know I'm not completely unbiased, but the reason I I was so glad to be involved in the process and to be aligned with this material is because it's important material, and there's a lot of it, like 11 solid hours of just stuff that I think will really get those synapses firing and get the ideas going around and and then beyond that, tell me about the book that is sort of in production and when do we expect it? So the book is supposed to be released on, on February 5, 2019, and uh, the title is Sex, Power, and Partisanship, How Evolutionary Science Makes Sense of Our Political Division. And it's really looking at how mating strategy is embedded in political partisanship. We briefly talked about this during our last conversation, but so, so um, political conservatism has a really distinct male, uh, you know, uh, feel about it. Like just like we were talking about with 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 the Islamic nations being the most conservative, and politically conservative, and being the most uh, restrictive in terms of, of of women's rights, for example. Um, so tracing that back to our evolutionary past, tracing that back to our reproductive drives, where did this stuff come from? I think so much of modern day politics is just baffling. Like things just don't make sense when you look at it on the, when you look at politics on, on the surface level, it's just a, it's just a circus. When you look at the ultimate causes of, of, of our political behavior, things tend to align. So, um, you know, my, my thought is, you know, some people get, get uncomfortable when we start talking about, about, you know, evolutionary psychology because they think, oh, gosh, but it does show us that we are prone to do terrible things to one another. What well, might have helped us to survive and thrive, you know, thousands of years ago now actually – produce a negative consequence in the quote unquote civilized world. That's certainly part of it, you know, but I, I, I firmly believe that, look, you know, we have to look at those things because if, if not, we're just, we're just going to be prone to enacting our worst impulses without even thinking about it. And, and the other, another thing that's also true about, about our evolutionary drives is it also creates the capacity for great compassion and, 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 uh, and just being thoughtful and and loving towards towards other people, being creative and constructive, instead of just tearing things down. So that's also a part of our evolved psychology. But we have a moral obligation to look at the former, just because of the human suffering that it has the potential to cause. Interesting. Uh, I think one of the best, at least, beginnings to a defense against our worst instincts is to be 
more and more self-aware. Knowledge is power, right? More and more self-aware. You know, there's this idea called instinct blindness that we we're just we're just not aware of most of our instincts. We just enact them without without thinking about them. And so, yeah, are, are we are we l- less inclined to enact them if we know that they're there? I would argue yes. I will put a link to your website in the description box. And if there's a pre-sale link to the book, I'll throw that in. But I'll make sure everybody knows where to go. And Dr. Hector Garcia, I'm glad to call you a friend. I'm so uh, glad to be a part of the Alpha God Project. And I'm really glad to be having these types of conversations that introduce people to kind of a new I don't know, a new layer of yeah. understanding about why we do what we do. Yeah. Well, listen, you and I, uh, you know, both are willing to have conversations about difficult topics, and I respect the hell out of that. But, you know, but, but let me ask something. Apart from the intellectual side of reading Alpha God, what is it like <laughs> reading a book out loud for 10 hours? Because I, I, I'll tell you what it's like for me. You read this. You read my words for for a solid ten hours, right? It's ten hours, eleven hours, nine yeah, hours. What is it? Yeah. Ten is it and like change. Eleven ish. Yeah. Okay. And of course, I reviewed every minute of that, you know, as part of the editorial process. But it was this really weird sensation that you and I had this long ten hour conversation, <laughs> intimate conversation, yeah. without ever having actually talked. I mean, we talked, but not for ten hours. You know, yeah. so having well, you read my words was just really this interesting feeling. You know, some there are a few purists who say that audiobooks are cheating. You know, you're not actually reading the book, and I think that's completely false. It is simply a, sort of an, another way to be introduced to the material, and it and depending on the material, sometimes it can be a, an enhanced experience. It can be something even greater than just you know being alone with the book and your thoughts, which I think I love. I still love to read. But being a traveler, being on the move so much, I love audiobooks. Sure. You know, my audible.com account is just crazy. I'm just always you know, pouring through this stuff. As far as your material, I don't obviously don't read the, the 11 hours straight. And I'm kind of my own worst enemy. I'll go through and I'll read the paragraph and I'll be like, no, I, that could have been better. Or I'd like to maybe read another one that's got a little more of oomph on this word and this phrase. And I'd like to try this. And then I'll go back and listen to it back and, and sort of meticulously manicure it so that I would want to listen to it. And it's interesting when you've got this thick ocean of scientific language. I mean, some of that stuff is it's pretty intimidating. So how do we make that palatable for the lay people who want to, they want to play? Like we all, and I include myself in this, I want to play along in this conversation. I want to be a part of this, but I don't have a PhD in evolutionary psychology. <laughs> you know, I don't, I'm going to have to be led by the hand through these deep waters. How do I read that? How do I inflect the words? Where do I put the pauses? How do I communicate and try to be true to what you have done and also, as best I can, make it uh, palatable. And I think you did the uh, viewer and the reader a lot of favors in the way that you wrote the book. Uh, you didn't write it for your peers. You wrote it for people. Like, you're not trying to impress us. You're trying to educate us. And there's a difference. So. I'm not pulling a Jordan Peterson. <laughs> you're going to get called. He's going to call you. If I hear the word salads coming out of you, we're going to call you. I'll have some. Um, we're going to schedule an intervention. Dr. Hector Garcia, I appreciate you so much, and we'll talk again soon, okay? Always a pleasure talking with you, Seth. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and T-shirts featuring The Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.